It's great to be together for worship this morning. As we get ready to open our service this morning, I just want to read from Psalm 118, verses 26 through 29. It, said, it says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever.
Well, good morning. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 46, beginning with verse 7, and we'll be reading to the end of the chapter. Again, that is Psalm chapter 46, verses 7 through 11. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Well, this morning, let's bow together as we lift our prayers to our almighty God. Heavenly Father, you are ever present with us as our fortress, our sustainer, and our savior. You are over all earthly rulers and authorities. The peace that our world so desperately seeks will be your peace that Jesus will bring when he comes again. You are to be exalted in all the earth, and that is our purpose today as we worship you. In this past week, you have provided for us in marvelous ways and answered our prayers in perfect timing and wisdom. You fulfill all of your promises and truth will only be found in you. Your holiness and light shine into all the corners of our lives and reveal the sinfulness hidden within. Not one of us is righteous. Because you loved us from the very beginning, you created the path to salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. Only in him can we boast. Only in him can forgiveness of our sin and restoration of life be achieved. Thank you, gracious Lord, for all you have done. I pray this morning for our brothers and sisters in Christ, giving thanks for all the ways that you have answered their specific prayers and ask that you continue to do so. Keep us grounded in your word and may the church continue to be guided and directed in service of the Great Commission. May we be listening and yielding to your Holy Spirit. We also pray for the missionaries that this church supports, the Hams, the Farkirkers, and Wynema Christian Camp, that they will be given renewed strength as they proclaim the gospel in faith and obedience. In just a few moments, Seth is going to proclaim your word and glorify your name through his preaching today. Empower your truth to pierce through Satan's deceptions and bring about salvation for those outside of Christ and bring revelation and maturity to those of us who know him. We pray this prayer together in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. I've been battling my daughter's car for almost a week now. Uh, the power steering pump went out and the design of the car makes it just really, really hard to work on. And one day this week was especially frustrating because I spent more time driving to auto parts stores than I actually did working on the car. In that one day, I made at least four separate trips to four different auto parts stores, as well as a couple of trips to Harbor Freight in between. I just couldn't seem to get all the parts and the tools that I needed collected so that I could get to work. And as we saw last week, there had been some, a lot of time passing since Jesus was born until his ministry really began. 
But we saw that he was working while he was waiting. But now things are really starting to pick up. And today as we begin, we find that Jesus is getting all the parts and the pieces and tools together that he needs for his mission. From the first, the very beginning, we've seen that God works through faithful people and even sometimes not so faithful people. As we went through the Old Testament, we saw how God worked through people like Noah and Joseph and Samuel and many others. But he also worked through people like Samson and even pagan kings of other nations sometimes. And this plan of the new covenant that God is unveiling through Jesus, that was going to require people to work alongside Jesus too. And we might think that Jesus would choose priests and scholars and great preachers and teachers to partner with him. But what we see is that Jesus chose simple, flawed, average, everyday people to follow him and to learn from him. Jesus had a lot of people who followed him and listened to his preaching. But there were 12 men that were set apart from the crowd. These are the men that we call the 12 disciples. They're Peter, Andrew, James, John, Bartholomew, also called Nathaniel, James the Younger, Judas Iscariot, Thaddeus, also called Jude, Matthew, also called Levi, then Philip, Simon the Zealot, and Thomas. And when we look at these men, we see that Jesus can build us together into much more than we are alone. These men were seemingly not too impressive on their own. They, they weren't people who other rabbis would have chosen to be their prized students. They were fishermen, tax collectors, and even religious extremists, but Jesus chose them to be his inner circle. In Mark chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, it says, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those who he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 of them that they might be with him and that, they might, that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. It says there that Jesus appointed these 12 to have extra authority. And that word for appoint is the Greek word poieo, which means to make or manufacture or construct. Jesus wasn't just drawing numbers out of a hat to pick his disciples. He was constructing a team. When I was in school, I loved to play basketball. And, and like most small towns, my school's rival in sports was the town that was just five miles away. I lived in Willamina, and our rival was the town of Sheridan. And when I was in school, the basketball coach in Sheridan was a guy named Larry Samples. And it was always super frustrating because it seemed like every year our team would have a more talented team, but Sheridan was, would always be a challenge for us to beat. And it was because their coach knew how to put the right combination of guys on the court together to get the best he could out of them. If there was a guy who was good at, at shooting from 12 to 15 feet, he would find ways to get that guy open in that range. And that guy just did his job. He wasn't taking shots that he couldn't make. Each player on that team did their job with the strengths that they had, not trying to do more than they could. And together they played better than a lot of other teams with more talent than they had. And that's sort of like what Jesus is doing here. He's, he's building his team, different people with different backgrounds, abilities, and, and strengths. But together with Jesus calling the shots, these guys were going to be able to do more than they ever dreamed they could. And Jesus is still doing that with us today. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13 says, Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its parts from what form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. And we see this same sort of imagery as the body or the church as the body of Christ made up of many parts when we look at Ephesians 4. In verses 15 and 16, it says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So it's us working together, doing our jobs in unity because we're all obeying and following the head, which is Jesus. And we see the reason why we need to work together as a body when we look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Here, Peter is describing the church not as a body, but as a house. Verses 4 and 5 say, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices 
acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then moving down to verse 9, he says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's it. That's the why. It's for the glory of God that we may declare the praises of God who's called us into his light. That's why we work together. So we, we see this team building for the glory of God at the beginning of Jesus' ministry here. He's calling together the people that he's going to pour himself into. These men are going to be with him and listen to him, watch him, walk in his footsteps for the next three years. And as part of that life together, Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the, the wedding of a friend. And what we see as we look at this story is with Jesus, miracles happen in everyday situations. A lot of times we think that for God to work through us, it has to be some big dramatic situation, or maybe we think simple, consistent, humble things that we do for Jesus just don't really matter. But if we're living in a relationship with Jesus, every situation, every day is a heavenly appointment. So this story of this wedding is in the second chapter of the Gospel of John. And verses 1 through 11 say, On the third day a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the, bride, the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. When we look at that passage, we see a profound miracle, but it's done in an average situation in a simple way. If we look at the red letters in that story, the words that Jesus spoke, other than what he said to his mother, Jesus spoke 18 words. He didn't say, by the power of the Almighty God, I command this water to become the best tasting wine anyone has ever tasted since the foundations of the world. He could have done that, but all he said was, fill the jars with water. And then he said, now draw some out, take it to the master of the banquet. That's all it took. But the result was that his glory was revealed and his disciples believed in him. And oftentimes we might miss out on being part of a miracle because we don't realize the opportunity because it seems too simple. A kind gesture of help or compassion to a stranger in need. A simple act of giving our time to talk with someone who's lonely or down. Comforting someone as they're grieving or struggling. Being ready to speak a word for Jesus when the time comes. Tim Long, who's a member of our church, drove for a ride-sharing service for a while. And he said that every time a passenger got into his car, he looked at it as a potential for a conversation about Jesus. He didn't force it on them, but because he had that perspective and he was ready almost every time an opportunity presented itself for him to talk about important eternal things with people. And, and who knows what lasting impact those conversations had on those passengers. See, with this miracle of Jesus turning water into wine, it took one person knowing what he was capable of. His mother, Mary, knew he could do something about this problem. And when he did, the people who were paying attention saw and believed. So we need to remember not to just go through life just being focused on the things of this world right in front of us. We need to, we know what, what Jesus is capable of, right? The creator and the master of the universe is with us at every moment. He's given us his spirit to live in us. That means that every situation, even the most mundane, becomes a potential miracle situation. So we need to be paying attention and remember what Jesus is capable of, because we could be part of the miracle of helping someone believe. Going back to the Gospel of John, there's someone else who's been paying attention to what Jesus has been doing. A religious leader named Nicodemus. 
And what we see in the conversation that he and Jesus have is that Jesus came to change everything. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, a high-level teacher of the Jewish law. But when he talks with Jesus, he finds himself in over his head, and he realizes maybe he doesn't know as much as he thought he did. And what's interesting is, even though Nicodemus doesn't really ask for it, Jesus, for the first time, really sort of lays out his whole mission. We find this conversation in John chapter 3, in verses 1 through 8. It says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, Jesus said, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So we might be able to see how Nicodemus is confused here. All he said was that he believes that Jesus was sent from God. And then Jesus lays this whole thing about being born again on him, and he's like, how does that work? But I think Jesus wants to take that belief that Nicodemus had, the belief that Jesus was sent from God, and focus it on the reality of what he came to do. Jesus doesn't want his message and his mission to get lost or missed because that can so easily happen, even to people who think they know the truth. I know people who will tell you all day long that they're good with God, but it has nothing to do with repenting or asking for forgiveness or, or a relationship with Jesus. They just think that since they believe in or acknowledge God that, that everything's fine. But James 2, 19 says, you believe that there is one God. Good, even the demons believe that and shudder. Remember, just after Jesus' baptism and his temptation in the wilderness, we, we saw that he began preaching. And what was he preaching? He's saying the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repentance is part of the process. Repentance is, is part of the good news. But today, a lot of us want forgiveness without repentance. We want God to forgive our sins, but we don't really want to change our sins. But Jesus is saying to Nicodemus here that rebirth, there's a rebirth that needs to happen. Being born again by water and the Spirit, dying to our old selves and living a new life in Jesus. And as Jesus continues talking to Nicodemus, it brings us to one of the most famous verses in the entire Bible, John 3.16. And some of your Bibles might not have quotations around these verses because there's some debate between translators as to whether these are the words of Jesus or of the, uh, the writer John. And I think there's good reason to believe that these are the words of Jesus. So here's what he says in John 3, 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. 
Like I said earlier, Jesus came to change everything. And most importantly, that includes us. Yes, it's true that God loves you just the way you are, but it's also true that if we are not in Christ, we stand condemned already. We, we might say or hear people say, I have Jesus in my life. And that's a nice thing, but Jesus didn't come just to be in our life. Jesus came so that our life can be in him. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't just mean that he's something that we add to our lives. It means that our new life is found in him. Colossians 3, 1 through 4 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. The idea that our life is hidden with Christ in God and that Christ is our life is a lot different than just having Jesus as part of our life, isn't it? And that's what Jesus is saying when he's talking to Nicodemus. He's, he's clarifying the old way of life. Life without being born again in him leaves us condemned. But because God, of God's great love for each of us, he has made a way for us through Jesus to not perish, but to have everlasting life. In John 10, verse 10, Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And that fullness comes through believing in Jesus, repenting of our sins, accepting him as Lord and Savior, and dying to our old selves as we follow him through the waters of baptism. And we share in that resurrection to new life in Jesus. So if you've never made that decision, I want to invite you to do that this morning. That new life, life to the full, it's available to you right here, right now. Don't pass up the chance to take it. This may be one of those miraculous moments for you. Maybe you came here today not expecting much to happen, but maybe Jesus had a miraculous transformation planned. If you'd like to make the decision to follow Jesus this morning, if you're watching our live stream, you can comment in, in the comment section, or if you're watching later on YouTube, you, you can go to our website, uh, westsalem.church, and click on the connection card tab, and let us know that you'd like to make a decision. We would love to help you take the next steps in following Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the fact that we can have new life. That even though in our selves, in our old life, we stand condemned, if we believe and follow Jesus, make him the Lord of our life, hide our life in him, and let him become our life, that we can have everlasting life with you. Thank you for your love that motivated you to do that. It's because you loved us so much that you were determined to make a way for us to come back to you. And we're thankful that Jesus went all the way to the cross, laid his life down to pay for our sins so that we can uh, have new life in you. Help us to carry that message with us each day. Help it to be evident in the lives that we live, that, that we live life in Christ now. And we pray all these things in his name. Amen.
Today, as we looked at the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, we read a verse where Jesus compares himself to the serpent that Moses lifted up in the desert. And that he, in that, he's referencing the Old Testament book of Numbers. The people of Israel had sinned against God, and God sent venomous snakes through the camp. When they repented, God told Moses to make a bronze snake and put it on a pole to be held up, and anyone who had been bitten and looked at the snake would live. In John 3, 14 and 15, Jesus says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And communion is a time when Jesus has asked us to remember the sacrifice that he made on the cross. This is a time when we can look to him on the cross. and Remember that if it were not for that sacrifice, we would still be suffering the sting of sin and death. But because of that sacrifice, we can share in his victory over sin and death. And so as we look to Jesus lifted up on the cross, we take the bread to remember his body that was broken. And we take the juice to remember his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray. God, thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus because we know that that's what makes it possible for us to not suffer the consequences of our sins the way that we should, but that Jesus took those sins and the consequence and the pain and the suffering for all of those things and he took it upon himself and he carried it to the cross. And he, the perfect lamb of God, laid down his life for us. So now we look to him on the cross and remember the sacrifice he made. And we do that as we celebrate and as we live in the new life that that sacrifice provides for us. And we thank you for your love and for the opportunity to 
come to you and to, to have a relationship with you, to be invited back, to be redeemed back into your family. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Today in our in-person service, we recognized young people who were graduates this year. And my daughter, Ivy, graduated this past week from high school. And one thing that they do in the Cascade School District, where my kids have gone, is an elementary school parade. There are three elementary schools in the district, and all the graduates who attended any of those elementary schools go back and parade through the halls of the school that they went to, visiting old classrooms and teachers. And it's a good reminder that there have been hundreds of people, from teachers to coaches to office workers and janitors, who have invested in these kids who are now graduating. And each of those people giving of themselves made an impact in the lives and the education of those students. And it's similar as we give to God, each of us giving of our abilities, our resources, our time, it all makes an impact on the mission of the church and the impact of the gospel around the world. So we don't want to lose sight of the internal in, eternal investment we are making when we give to the mission of the gospel. So if you'd like to give this morning financially to support the mission of this church and the mission of the gospel around the world, this is your opportunity to do that. I'm glad we got to spend this time together in worship today. I hope that you had a, a meaningful experience and, and uh, you were able to express your worship to God and, and uh, hear from him through his word. And I want to encourage you to just uh, continue to live out your faith, to look for those maybe even simple moments this week that can be miraculous times that Jesus can work through. Let's pray as we get ready to sing our closing song. Father, we thank you for this time to be together. Thank you for uh, the chance to be a part of your body, to be a part of your, uh, your house, spiritual house that you're building, and, and to be living stones that you can, uh, you can work with and you can put us together uh, in ways that are going to glorify you and, and work toward your will. Help us to uh, be prepared to, to step into the situations you put before us this week, to, to be your hands and feet, to, to uh, represent you, to speak the truth in love to people uh, in a way that's going to draw them closer to you. Watch over us as we uh, go into this week and, and uh, fill us with your spirit and empower us to do the things you've called us to do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
I am 